All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest tonight. It's Jan. Welcome to the show, Jan. Thank you. It's nice Absolutely. to be here. It's my pleasure. I'm glad to I'm glad to have you on the show. So I know you've got some experiences you want to share with us. So let's get right into it. Why don't you just take us back to where you were, what you were doing, and what happened to you? Okay. Um, one very interesting story uh, happened in uh, northern Kentucky. It was Trimble County. And I'm a member of Tom Shea's group, uh, Northern Kentucky Bigfoot Research Group. And it was in September. And we all set up around Friday afternoon at camp, at base camp. And I had brought, for gifting, I brought a colored bouncy ball and a bag of apples. I thought this, you know, maybe... I'm always trying to think of what will intrigue the squatch or get its attention or maybe capture a handprint or, you know, whatever. So, um, scattered the apples around. There was a really wide trail uh, that the homeowner had for using uh, like quads and things like that. But there was nobody there at that time, just the group. And... Uh, so this, I put several apples on a stump and the rest I just scattered down on the ground and a couple landed in the middle of this wide trail. The bouncy ball, I just sat in the woods. And so throughout the day, you know, the evening, we heard uh, some acorns hitting with a little force. I mean, they weren't just falling off the trees. We believe they were thrown. And... And we talked and had a good time. And uh, I went to bed about probably around 1 a.m. And some of the guys stayed up around the campfire and they just uh, slept in their like anti-gravity chairs. And I had a tent at that time. So uh, I went to bed in the tent. And the next morning, of course, I couldn't wait to see, you know, if there was anything moved around or if anybody heard anything after I went to bed. So. He got up and went to check the apples. And, you know, I could see the bouncy ball was still right where I put it. And the apples were still on the stump. And I was walking along. And, and the trail actually curved where my tent was. It was heavily wooded right behind that. But the trail curved behind that. So uh, where I put the apples was probably about 60 feet from where my tent was located. And I'm walking along, and I just stopped. There was one apple that was just flat. Most were untouched, but one was in the trail, and it was just flat, like a steamroller ran over it. And I, you know, started looking at it closer, and there's no tread marks. Nobody had been out there, um, you know, on a quad or a Jeep or whatever. And so I, I went back, and I told the guys said, you know, this, this is weird. This is uh, something really super heavy. <sighs> Stepped on that, ran over it, whatever. There's no tread imprint. So um, one of the other guys, uh, John, in our group, came out to inspect it with me. And I, we tried to replicate it. Um, grabbed one of the apples and, and set it down and... Um, I tried stepping on it, just walking over it. I mean, there was hardly any damage to it at all. No, you know, you couldn't see my boot imprint or anything. And so then I, I tried, I was holding onto his shoulder and I was bouncing up and down on the apple to see if I could get it to flatten or whatever. You could see a little bit of boot imprint, but that was it. So it's like, I think I know what did it. So <laughs> we'll just leave it with that. But um, yeah, that was, it was pretty interesting. What else are you guys experiencing out there? I've had Tom on the show and we talked about some of the things that he's done. Obviously he's done tons of cast and he's found fingerprints. He's found all kinds of interesting footprints and he's casted most of those and they've ended up in, well, I think he sends just about everything he does over to Cliff Brackman and he's got it in his, categories of different things that he collects for the museum as well as i think jeff meldrum has some of tom's cast what else are you guys finding out there have 
you've had any experience with any other items that you guys have left out. I know like Tom told the story about leaving the Nutella jar out and getting a pretty cool cast out of that with some fingerprints. What else are you guys finding out there? Are you getting a lot of vocalizations? Are you having physical, like visible sightings of these things? What else are you, you finding in your activity with Bigfoot? Uh, well, we have a new location right now and it's, it's a real hot spot. It's a great area. Um, you know, Tom gets us into some great areas because he has homeowners calling him, you know, they're actually frightened because of the activity going on. Um, currently they're experiencing, um, knocks on their house, you know, banging on the house, uh, vocals that the, the Homeowner actually saw one, I believe, twice. Um, Tom, she saw one going up over the barbed wire fence. And she went out there after it was gone. And she found a massive footprint and hair and what looked like a little piece of tissue. So I know Tom did go out and collect that. Uh, that was being sent in. Um yeah, a lot of vocals. Uh, the first time they stayed out at the location, I wasn't with them at that time. It was like a spur of the moment. Uh, didn't have time to go. Um, they could hear heavy breathing. They had canopies with tarps because it was bitter cold and a propane heater inside. And they could hear like a very heavy breathing outside. and. Keith, one of our members, had parked his truck just several feet from the, the canopy. And the next morning they went out and they took pictures. You could see where something had brushed up aside, you know, aside the his truck and left marks all over it. Um, they had a bucket of Kentucky fried chicken that was messed with. Um, one member actually thermed something running up the side of the hill which you know we can't confirm uh what it was but you know we can only speculate uh yeah there's a lot of activity going on there um you know in the past i, I had really good luck with reese's cups at a different location i had a bag that i sat out and the next morning i'm always really excited when i put things out late afternoon or early evening I'm really excited in the morning to see what's happened, what's changed. And I always take photographs, you know, Tom always says document everything, you know, take lots of photos, you know, so you can tell if anything was touched or moved. Or, but yeah, there was no question with these Reese's cups, something with hands opened the entire bag and there was a trail, a trail of wrappers. And we found huge footprints. I believe we got two castings out of that. That was probably two years ago, but yeah, it's, it's ongoing. It's all the time. Like I said, Tom is, he's a great researcher. Um, I can't see enough good things about him. He gets us into great areas. He's very knowledgeable. He shares that knowledge with us as far as his experiences and, and what to look for. Uh, he's an expert tracker. So, and he does share that information with us and what to look for. And <clears throat> so, yeah, it's it's a great experience. It really is. Yeah, it's one of the things that I love about Tom is the documentation. He's very methodical in making sure that things get documented before, during, and after. And even if it seems in, insignificant at the time, it's it's all about collecting the evidence and finding out what may come out of it in the interim, or it may not be anything. And we, when he was on the show, we talked a little bit about even fakes, right? Going out and people hoaxing evidence and things like that. Even gathering those foot castings and whatever the case may be that they're faking helps, in my opinion, push the investigation forward because you now know what people are faking and you know what they're using to fake these things. And it, it makes it a little bit easier to determine if something's actually real or if it's faked. And that's one of the things I asked Tom when he was on the show. We talked about one or two particular cases when he went out and actually found that people were hoaxing evidence, which I think is great because hoaxing sort of sets us back, I think, in the big scheme of things. But it also helps a little bit because 
you're mm-hmm. discovering what these people are doing and, and how they're getting the ideas and, and all those things. Have you guys run across any, I'm always very interested in tree structures and things of that nature. Are you guys seeing any of that stuff out in the field? Yeah, occasionally. Um, our last research site, I, I think it was interesting that uh, the homeowner actually had two trails going back to our uh, base camp. And one day they found where huge branches were snapped off and drug across, blocking both paths into the uh, into base camp. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we find different things, uh, tree breaks. And uh, I mean, not all the time. It's not as common probably as, you know, the vocals that we hear and, and things of that nature, but they're out there. I've always been very curious about the the tree structures, and I've I've said that on the show many times, and I've had people that I've frankly disagreed with. I'm more of a one-to-one correlation kind of evidence-based person, so until somebody actually sees a Sasquatch making a tree structure, right? I don't think there's ever been a documented case that I know of of someone walking up on a Sasquatch making a tree structure, so I've always been very hesitant when people talk about tree structures. I found things here on my property that are very intriguing to me in North Carolina. And Mm -hmm. I was out in the woods just a couple of weeks ago, actually filming the, some pickups for a television show that I'm doing. And the guy was filming. He's like, what is that over there? And I'm like, well, I've been by that area a couple of times and I thought it was kind of interesting. So I go over and the more I started looking, it looked like just a bunch of trees that were broken and, you know, down in this particular area. The more I stood there, And the more I looked and the more the cameraman was pointing out, like, that looks weird. And I'm like, holy shit, that does look weird. (laughs) You know, and the (laughs) more I started looking into it, I thought, there's almost no way that could be natural. And there's these limbs that are behind other limbs that have limbs stuck in between them and they're bent around trees. And I'm like, snow load doesn't do that. Wind doesn't do that. And this is like 150 yards, maybe 200 yards from my house in the woods where I've heard vocalizations. And Mm -hmm. I just, I was scratching my head and he's, of course, he's filming me this whole time. And I'm like, I don't want to look like an idiot on television. This is on my property. And it's like, I'm just discovering it. But it was a real moment of like, this could possibly be something more than just natural trees laying over or whatever the case may be. So I'm always curious to to talk to researchers who go out in the field and get their opinion on that because I've always, like I said, I've, I've people tend to start to believe you have one experience or you see one thing or hear one thing and then everything becomes Bigfoot. Every broken tree is a, is a tree break and those kind of things. So I'm very weary of that, but it literally happened to me a couple of weeks ago on my own property. And now I'm scratching my head. Like, I, I don't know. I keep going back to that area. Now when I'm, when I'm hiking over these last couple of weeks and I keep looking and scratching my head thinking, how in the hell could that happen naturally? And I don't know. I just don't know. And it's one of those enigmas that more questions lead to more questions lead to more questions. And I think ultimately for, for research and investigations, I think that's actually a good thing. So sorry. I went oh. on a <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I mean, the more I experience, the more questions I have. And I think that I think a lot of us feel that way. Just, um, you know, regarding the tree structures and what do they mean? You know, what do they mean? You know, you hear about some of them that that are actually like a nest and it may uh, smell inside. People will say, yeah, it had this horrible, horrible odor inside. You know, and it may have like evergreens over the top, you know, a little structure with evergreens. And it clearly looks like something has been bedding down there. And there there are other cases where they're just, you know, branches, you know, like you said, kind of woven in. You know, what does that mean? You know, where they didn't bed down or anything, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, there are no experts on the subject, so it's only speculation, but it's very it's very intriguing, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think that's what continues to drive me is the the questions that I have. Every time I talk to somebody new on the show, I do another interview and people bring things up that I don't necessarily, maybe not even agree with. But when 
they've had these experiences, I can't deny what somebody's experiencing. So I take that with a grain of salt and I sort of wrap it into this bundle of things that I think I know about the subject. And I start to research and look into some of the claims that people make, some of the photos that I get and things like that. And it's, it's just one of those enigmas that nobody really knows. And I say that often, it's, it's all about, like you said, speculation, right? We're all speculating until these things are actually identified and recognized as a species. And then we can figure out what they are, where they came from and, and what they do. But what, what other experiences have you had personally when you've been out researching? Have you had other experiences that you've had yourself? Uh, myself, I was uh, in Western Kentucky and I had dropped one guy off and there was another car with a couple behind them and they wanted to stop and they wanted to stop at a bridge where there's a river and they were going to walk around there. So I I drove on up the road, you know, it's an old gravel road, miles from anything, anywhere. And I stopped there and it was very cold. So I was sitting in the car, I let the car run for a little bit and I shut up, you know, with the window down. And every once in a while I'd get out and do a couple whoops and, you know, clap. And maybe about the third, I did it maybe three times. And I sat back in the car and I would use the thermal too. I'd scan around with my thermal, wasn't seeing anything. And um, within a couple minutes of that last one, the last whoop and clap I did, I'm not a good judge of distance, but I'm guessing maybe 60 or 80 feet off to my right into the woods. I heard the loudest, clearest whoop that I've ever heard. So something was very, very close. I wish I would have recorded it. I wish I would have had a recorder with me because it was, it was a great whoop. <laughs> but yeah. some of yeah. the vocalizations that, that people have heard here in North Carolina, I had Julie Wrench and David Ellis from the Olympic project on a couple of months back. And we did an entire show about the things that Julie's recorded on her property in North Carolina. I've heard some of the very similar things that she's recorded about two, maybe three hours away from my property here, we've heard here on our property. So the vocalizations are always very interesting to me too, because we're hearing the same things or people are hearing the same things in the Southeast and Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia. You're also hearing it in the Pacific Northwest. It's being recorded in Ohio. I've heard things on the property here that sound very much like the Ohio how that Matt Moneymaker recorded in Ohio. So mm -hmm. I'm always curious about you know, when you're going out and you're seeing tree structures and then you're catching footprints and you're, you're seeing hair evidence and then you're getting whoops and these hollers and, and even some of the tree knocks and things like that, which some people have speculated maybe these things using their teeth clacking or they're making those sounds more with their mouth than they are with actually hitting trees. So it's all very interesting to me. I know one story that you shared with me via email. I wanted you to talk a little bit about what, what happened with the bouncy balls in the woods. Um, it disappeared, uh, not that weekend, but uh, it did disappear. And I don't recall hearing that they ever did find it. Um, now I did buy one for our new research area um, at uh, CryptidCon in Lexington recently. Uh, Cliff Berrickman was telling us about someone he knows that has good luck retrieving hair samples with a bouncy ball and then using Velcro on the outside. So uh, I purchased some of that and I gave it to Tom. Um, whether he's used it or not, I don't know. I haven't heard. Um, in our new research area, it's going to be a little difficult to do some of the gifting because the homeowner actually has so many animals. So we'd have to be really careful not to, uh, you know, I don't want to put chocolate out because uh, they have three dogs. I don't want them getting into it or I don't want something contaminated. You know, uh, what are their other animals doing something? And we don't know what it was, you know, if we don't see it happen, you know, it's kind of a, uh, it's a little trickier at this place, but I can we'll figure it out. I, I, I have faith in you. 
That's one of the things I found interesting in, in some of the innovative ways that researchers and investigators are going out to try to get evidence. I know that's something that I've talked to Doug Hychek about from Monster Quest, and Doug has done that with bouncy balls and other toys and even cameras and things. He'll take or has in, in the past taken like trail cams and taken the batteries and everything out of them and just laid them out for these things to come up and play with because some of them are very curious and he's trying to collect fingerprints and any hair evidence and things like that. So anything that I think you can bring out in the woods into their environment that's odd, like a bouncy ball or even a camera that doesn't have anything in it that's not recording, I think is a very interesting way to try to capture evidence. And that's that's one of the things I know Doug has done often is try to come up with new and inventive ways to capture. He's very interested in the sebum that these things excrete, this white sort of chalky, milky substance that we all have on our fingers and toes and things like that. Well, clearly these things do as well. And that's one of the things Doug is trying to capture is the sebum and sort of go into doing some testing and things like that to see maybe if it's very similar to us or maybe other known primates or things mm -hmm. like that. So very interesting stuff. I really, uh, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing. So you, you mentioned you're part of Tom's group. Tell everybody, if you wouldn't mind, where they can find the group. I know you guys have a Facebook page. Is that right? We do. Yeah. Northern Kentucky Bigfoot Research Group. It's on Facebook. Check it out. Join up. We have I'm a, a lot member. of. I'm a member. I love to. I love to get in there and see people's stories and the things that everybody shares. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I highly encourage everybody to go on and check it out. Oh yeah, I do too. Very interesting. Well, awesome, Jan. I really appreciate you coming on and I appreciate your time and I appreciate you sharing your, your stories with us. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Absolutely. It's my pleasure.